Hi, everybody. All right, so we're um, doing the second session out of the March April gather, and we're on page 32. So, this is have you guys read this one yet? Yes, I have. It's, I, I like it. <laughs> I wish you would start with this one, <laughs> but it maybe wouldn't have made as much sense. So, we'll start with the prayer. Yes. God, creator of all living things, you fashioned a world in which lands and waterways, plants and animals together meet the needs of all that you made. We pray that such vitality may flourish around the globe. Bless those who work the soil and in many channels, uphold their towns and villages, nurture bees and other pollinators, protect farmlands and ranches from drought and flood. Free children from forced labor in the fields. Grant an economy that can sustain those families who treasure a rural life. Teach us how to share with everyone the benefits of each harvest and accept our gratitude for all sustenance you provide. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, let's see. I'd be willing to guess that alongside your Bible in this magazine, there's a bite or two of some kind of food. Not here. <laughs> Scripture is like food. It nourishes us and sustains us. The goal of this study is not to prescribe one way of eating. Doing so would, would deny the beautiful diversity of cultures, health, and principles that influence how we eat. It's also impossible to claim some way of biblical eating, since people back then ate in a great many ways. Even so, we can learn a lot from what the Bible says about food. We often forget that the way we eat matters, not just for our own bodies, but for the bodies and lives of our neighbors near and far, and to the non-human world. Food is one more way we can love the Lord our God and love our neighbors as ourselves. So take a bite of something good and let's talk about food. So first up is Luke 14. You want to do that one, Marcia? Sure. This is 7 through 14. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler who belonged to the Pharisees, they were watching him. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal? Am I in the right place? Mm -hmm. no. Seven to fourteen. I heard it once. Uh, seven to fourteen. Now he told the parable to those who were invited when he marked how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a marriage feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest a more eminent man than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your kinsmen or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return, and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Okay. Else you wanna go ahead? Okay. In Jesus' day, most Jewish families were were subsistence farmers or tradespeople growing some of their own food and trading for others. Bread, vegetables, grains, legumes, fruit, and olives were part of a simple diet. Those by the water ate fish. But like many people around the world today, most consumed meat on special days or as a small part of their daily diet. Without refrigeration, there was usually just enough for the day. Jesus depends, Jesus spends a lot of time eating with people. Then as now, shared meals build relationships and demonstrate care. Jesus' meals topple hierarchies and depict a radical hospitality where we invite people to our tables who are not like us, people who might not be able to pay us back. Jesus' own practice teaches us the faithful eat, that faithful eating is not just about what we eat, but with whom we eat. In the Bible, weddings bring an abundance of food, wine, and community. 
The whole town is invited. Animals are slaughtered, wine flows freely. Jesus often describes the reign of God as a wedding banquet with lavish joy, community, and food. Sometimes our kids bring out the wine glasses for ordinary weeknight dinners, filling them with milk. Throughout the meal, they'll make toast saying, cheers. Sitting down with other people to share a meal is, is unlike anything else we do as humans. No matter what's on our plates, we glimpse the, we glimpse the love and joy Jesus describes as the heavenly wedding feast. So it says, think of a meal you shared with people outside your inner circle. Who was there? What made it happy or joyful? How did you experience the inbreaking of God's reign in those moments? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Was it well attended? Yep. Yeah, it was. I didn't get back to that. <laughs> What? I saw the fire trucks out there. Fish oh, the fire. The fire. 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 So, who all, who all did you see there? She was that my name. Well, you really expanded your, your inner circle. You really <laughs> your inner circle there, didn't you? There's a lot of people I haven't seen. Oh, okay, you know. good. I didn't good. talk to them all, but, you know, saw people. You see people, you don't. Know, Since you wave and say hi. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. It's nice to, the ones you don't know, they're the clearing the other side of the room. Yeah. And if you go by them, you see, but if not, you, you don't. I mean, <laughs> yeah. when, at Christmas, we, early December, we have a potluck for our HOA down there. Mm -hmm. And everybody brings stuff. And there's a lot of people I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we sat by some people that were brand new that I didn't know at all. And, and a couple other people I really didn't know that well. And it was fun. Get to know. On Saturday, we went to a hundredth anniversary. It was two couples that were married, a brother and a sister, um, that they married within a couple months of each other. So they put the two together and celebrated a hundred years anniversary. <laughs> oh, 50, 50 for each. Yes. <laughs> and um, I knew the, the wife, and I knew two other people there. John knew one other person there, <laughs> and then one of the people, Anna, was there, and she knew someone that was a youth director at in Decora, and so it was kind of it was strange being in that many people, and you really don't know them, and um, the connection. Let's see, in breaking of God's reign. Well, the Looney Lutherans were there to perform. And they picked out a number of Lutheranisms that they made fun of, kind of like the um, church basement women or church basement oh, ladies. Yeah. Yeah. It was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> where it was St. Paul. Yeah, we're, we're going to take a hold of them. <laughs> we can do it, maybe do it this, like, this oh, summer. Oh, yeah. that'd be fun. So it was, it was uh, yeah. We never said it's most certainly true during any of the things. No, we didn't. Oh. But talked a lot about casseroles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Potlucks. And Potlucks and green jello. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was it was strange to be in that many people because there had to be over 200 mm -hmm. and not know that many people. Um, it was good. We visited with people we didn't know and, mm -hmm. and that. Oh, and my brother-in-law's funeral. Uh, they had more more tables set aside for family than was needed, and so um, and there was not enough room for some of the other people who had stayed. So they're like, "Are you okay?" Yes, ready to move. So we ended up sitting with the, the one gentleman was my mom's tax guy for many years, and um, I knew him. And the other young lady that came and sat with us, she was actually a friend of my niece's. We're gaming friends, so we know each other from being online. And she she sat down and we got to talking. I said, so, so where are you from? Oh, she, she's uh, um, on staff at Ewaldo. And I'm like, really? What do you do there? Well, I can't remember. She was in charge of, I'm trying to remember, meals, I think, or something, or catering, or whatever it is. Oh. But I was like, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> she goes, yeah. And I said, have you been? Uh, yeah, a few times. Yeah, probably. Yeah, and then just not too not long too ago, long. we were at the Stone Center. She said, "Well, did you have a meal catered?" I said, "No, I think 
they brought in their own food, but still, I've been, you know, we've been there and she's like, oh, so I thought we are just going to have to come over sometime. Say hello. So it was just, it was kind of neat to just, yeah, it was like, yes. <laughs> she's a very, very nice young lady, very, very personable and very, I was like, oh, we can't be very nice. <laughs> For, you know, 20 something, <laughs> you know. Some of the twenty something kids these days, it, it, it's hard to have a conversation with them. <laughs> it's like if, if you don't know anything about gaming or you know, yeah, kind of stuff, it's like down their phone. Yeah, or get them to put down their phones, yeah, for more than you know two minutes. Yeah, it's like okay, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I really enjoyed talking with her. I just, and I was grateful that my niece had someone badly in her life because mm -hmm. they they really haven't attended church much since my dad had and uh, neither one of them are baptized either one of their kids so it's like okay mm -hmm. so, yeah i was just yeah. i was grateful that she had this person in her life yeah. Yeah. you know i thought you know that's that's a good thing mm -hmm. and i was even more grateful that she had come such a distance I and mean, she came further than we did Either, she would have come from Strawberry Point, so yeah. yeah. Anyway, so are we moving it? Let's see. We have Exodus 16, 1 through 33. I think this is the Passover. No, this is the story of the manna, right? Yes. Do, you, do we need to read this? Do you feel we need to read this? Does everybody want to read this? or? <laughs> Do, do they read it, or do they rely on us reading it? Not necessarily. Discussions? I mean, just okay. you, you, you both. I think they need to listen. So, I mean, we can if you want to. I don't care. Can we read it? Go for it. No. Go for it, ladies. 16, 1, 1 through 31. 31. Yes, I think it's, it's kind of right here. Yeah, kind of. No, not all. Parts of it. Go ahead. Go for it. Go for it. Israel. Community set out from Elam, and on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had left Egypt, they came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. There is the desert they all complained to Moses and Aaron, and said to them, We wish that the Lord had killed us in Egypt. There we would at least sit down and eat meat, and as much other food as we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve us all to death. The Lord said to Moses, now I am going to cause food to rain down from the sky for all of you. The people must go out every day and gather enough for that day. In this way I can test them to find out if they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to bring in twice as much as usual and prepare it. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In the morning you will see the dazzling light of the Lord's presence. He has heard your complaints against him, yes, against him, because we are only carrying out his instructions. Then Moses said, it is the Lord who will give you meat to eat in the evening and as much bread as you want in the morning. Because he has heard how much you have complained against him. You come complain against him, us, you are really complaining against the Lord. Moses said to Aaron, tell the whole community to come and stand before the Lord because he has heard your complaints. As Aaron spoke to the whole community, they turned toward the desert, and suddenly the dazzling light of the Lord appeared in a cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight they will have meat to eat, and in the morning they will have all the bread they want. Then they will know that I, the Lord, am their, am their God. In the evening a large flock of quails flew in, enough to cover the camp. And in the morning, there was dew all around the camp. When the dew evaporated, there was something thin and flaky on the surface of the desert. It was as delicate as frost. When the Israelites saw it, they didn't know what it was and asked each other, What is it? Moses said to them, This is the food that the Lord has given you to eat. The Lord has commanded that each of you is to gather as much as he needs, two quarts for each member of his household. Israelites did this, some did gathering more, others less. When they measured it, those who gathered much did not have too much, and those who gathered less did not have too little. 
Each had gathered just what he needed. Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it for tomorrow. But Solomon did not listen to Moses and saved part of it. The next morning it was full of worms and smelled rotten, and Moses was angry with them. Every morning each one gathered as much as he needed, and when the sun grew hot, what was left on the ground melted. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much food, four quarts for each person. All the leaders of the community came and told Moses about it, and he said to them, The Lord has commanded that tomorrow is a holy day of rest, dedicated to him. They put today what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Whatever is left should be put aside and kept for tomorrow. As Moses had commanded, they kept what there was left until the next day. They did not spoil or get worms in it. Moses said, Eat this today, because today is the Sabbath, a day of rest dedicated to the Lord, and you will not find any food outside the camp. You must gather food for six days, but on the seventh day, the day of rest, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather food, but they did not find any. Then the Lord said to Moses, how much longer will you people refuse to obey my commands? <laughs> Remember that I and the Lord have given you a day of rest. And that is why on the sixth day will always give you enough food for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day and not leave his home. So that people do not work on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the food banna. It was like a small white seed and tasted like thin cakes made with honey. Moses said, the Lord has commanded us to save some manna to be kept for our descendants, so they can see the food which he gave us to eat in the desert when he brought us out of Egypt. Okay. I don't remember that last one. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I tell you? Yeah, okay, did, you did I not say? How many times did I say? <laughs> it sounds like something we've heard before. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same thing. What does this story tell you about faith and food? Even when you don't listen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Despite us. Even when you're not in following us. In spite of us. That's exactly right. right. In spite of us. Okay, Carly, you want to go on? After God's people are liber liberated from slavery in Egypt, they wander for a long time through the desert wilderness. When the food they had packed runs out, they complain against the Lord. Through Moses and Aaron saying, If only we had died by the hand of the, of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Hearing their complaints, God sends a flaky food they call manna to cover the ground. The word manna is related to the question, which sure. in Hebrew means, what is it? This manna bread from heaven arrives each morning except on the Sabbath, and quail show up in the evening. Okay. Pastor and cartoonist Dale Erlander calls this 40-year period the wilderness school, where the people learn about being faithful to God. In Erlander's words, those lessons include lesson one, God gives manna for all, and lesson two, hoarding stakes. <laughs> <laughs> From the gift of manna, we have mastered that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we've mastered that one. From the gift of manna, the people learn that all food is God's. In fact, everything is God's. We own nothing. We can trust God for daily bread. God gives everyone enough for each day, somewhat more, either out of fear or out of a desire to gain power from what they've accumulated. When people take too much, the manna grows worms and toils. It starts to stink. The lessons here are also for us. Trust God for daily bread. Hoarding our food and other things stinks. When we share more, when we take and waste less, we become part of the way God provides daily bread for all. So when or how have you learned the lessons that were stinks <laughs> and that God gives me an all? I think, yeah, it's very yeah. important. We learn so, yeah. some people can have people go out of the store. Yeah. Yeah. 
explosive. Well, and how mean people can be about it too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was not good. That was not good at all. Yeah. It always seems like there's enough, right? Okay. Learn to all this. Yeah, you really that need too. that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, no. Okay. That I read the other day that you, know, you basically come into this world with love and you leave this world in love, and that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't get to take the bank accounts with you. You don't get to take the extra cars and the all the stuff and everything else. It's just yeah. So if you don't have somebody to love you, it's in your own way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does stink. You're exactly right. It stinks. That's right. You're right. You're so right. Okay, Genesis 1, 27 to 31. A lot of Old Testaments. I mean, there's all of these have had a lot of Old Testaments. I'm not sure where it starts, so I'm going to start with Genesis. Genesis 9. Or, one. Right. God's book, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature, so they can be re <clears throat> responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings, he created a God life, <clears throat> reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female, God blessed them, prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Then God said, <clears throat> I have given you every sort of seed-bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit-bearing tree, given them to you for food, all animals and all birds, everything that moves and breathes. I give whatever grows out of the ground for food. For there it was. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. It was evening. It was morning. Day six. Oh. <laughs> God's first words to humanity echo the voices of so many grandmothers. Here's some food. Sit down, eat, enjoy. God begins with a gift of food, inviting us to relate to creation in ways of kinship and reciprocity. God is saying, see, I have given you, and the critters too, all these vegetables and all this fruit to eat. It's the opposite of other Mesopotamian creation stories of the time which claim that humanity's creation was for the sole purpose of supplying food to their gods. But for our God, always, the divine arrow goes downward. God gives an abundance of food, not just to humans, but to everything that has breath. Well, in the beginning, God's abundant diet for humanity is plant-based, just vegetables and fruit. Nobody, not even the creatures, must die to feed another. All beings can flourish without violence. There is enough food for every creature. Genesis says, God saw everything that God made, and indeed, it was very good. This very goodness is not just about the humans created on that sixth day, but about the amazing goodness of all creation, together in wholeness and interdependence, thriving and abundant as God made them. This vision of the world is echoed in Isaiah 11, 6, 9, where we read, where we read that the lion shall eat straw like an ox, and the wolf shall live with the lamb at a time when they will not hurt or destroy. We no longer live in that perfect goodness of Genesis where neither human nor creature killed another to live. But God's very goodness continues. And that vision of all creation can shape the choices we make about what we eat. So what are your favorite vegetables or fruits? And how can we eat more plants than our being Favorite vegetables? Broccoli. Oh, <laughs> <Yuck>. <laughs> Anything but Brussels sprouts. <laughs> I, 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 I even like Brussels sprouts. I love, I love fruits and veggies. Yeah, I do. I like it. What about fruits? What's your favorite fruit? 
pears off our tree. Oh, they are so good. Strawberries. Yeah, I can't think of Apples. one that I don't like. Bananas. Bananas. We have strawberries almost all the time. And bananas we have all the time. Apple, apple fruit. That's about I think it's a change. Pumpkin. 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 So, mm -hmm. are you guys big, you're, you're a big veggie eater. I am. Fruits and veggies, I can throw a little tiny piece of meat once in a while, I'm fine. Mm. I'm, I'm more so that way than I'm supposed to get more protein, and I don't like a lot of the protein. <laughs> oh, like the beans and the legumes? And you don't see that. I'm a big bean person. I'm a bean person. Enough in a, in that for a meal, you know. Mm -hmm. Like when you eat breakfast and you just eat, you know, cereal. Mm -hmm. Fruit and yogurt. I like meat. Breakfast too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. It's like ice cream. Yeah, it is. Okay, so we have Genesis 9. This, I love the stakes that are high. The <laughs> Genesis 9, 1 to 11. So things shifted after the flood. But God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, The fruitful and increase the number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, and upon all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you, just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood life still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, and from every man, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. <coughs> After the flood, God again blesses God's people and refuses to give up on humanity. Again, our generous God gives the gift of food. But now, in addition to the stuff that grows from the soil, humans are permitted to eat the stuff that moves. I give you everything, God says. Well, not quite everything. God adds, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Much ink and blood have been spilled over what is meant by this. Even as God permits the eating of meat, he demands a respect for the value of life, all life. In her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer, a scientist, writer, and member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation, offers a helpful perspective about what she calls an honorable harvest. She writes, the taking of another life to support your own is far more significant when you recognize the beings more harvested as persons, non-human persons, vested with awareness, intelligence, spirit, and who have families waiting for them at home. Killing a who demands something different than killing an it. In Genesis, God speaks clearly about the value of human life and against harming other human beings. As we think about responsible eating, Restraint is not just about the killing or mistreatment of our non-human kin, but about the environmental consequences of our diet. 
which can also impact human lives. The way we eat impacts our climate. For example, raising and producing meat contributes significantly to greenhouse gases and uses many land and water resources. We can promote food systems and ways of eating that tend to be to the well-being of creatures, land, water, and other humans who already feel the impact of climate change. One way to do this is to eat less meat. I try to eat mostly vegetarian for the sake of the planet, critters, and my own health. But I'm also the granddaughter of a farmer who raised hogs. We have the resources, as well as the zip code, to access meat from amazing local producers. I'll eat whatever someone puts on my plate when I am blessed to be at their table. Each of us can try to eat in ways that respect and value life. All. How might these passages from Genesis challenge or confirm our own eating habits? I think what it sometimes comes down to is is ways I mean I think about the Indians and when they had meat they, they gave used, thanks for and they used, it, and they used everything. They used okay. every bit of it. The yeah. skin and the, the everything. And nothing went to how many waste. pounds of food including meat are yes. thrown away. Agreed. Needlessly. Agreed. You know, so I, I like meat and you know, vegetables and fruit, but I mean... And I think here in the United States, we're one of the worst offenders yeah. of wasting and throwing away food that, that, in the world even. I mean, I'm not saying we aren't the only ones, yeah. but I think we're among the worst. Yeah. We have a generous supply, so we eat what we want and throw away what yeah. we don't. And that's... You get a big old hamburger and you eat, or the kids will eat just a little bit out of it and yes. throw it away. Yeah. Or people going to um, buffets. Yeah. And they look yeah. at the plate. Oh, oh, yes. And then they walk away and get some more and leave a lot yeah. and on their plate. Because they want something different. Different, yeah. yeah. And it's like... Really? You take a little bit that you think you can eat, and then if you want more, then you go back and get a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I think the tendency wants us to be stewards and not take that for granted, mm -hmm. and not take it needlessly. Mm -hmm. Whether it, whether we scale down and eat less meat, or if we eat what's given, or like rescue. Rescue part yes. of the food pantries. Yes. Well, we have more. Did you see what was there the other day? No. Well, um, we went to the restaurant over in Belmont. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 They closed? Yes. yes. Yeah. Monster. Yeah. Anyway, um, she had huge cans of, you know, Christmas. Assorted buy, things. They buy sure. everything in bulk. Yeah. You know, sure. so, I mean, there were huge packages of spaghetti and. Yeah. <laughs> it's surprising how some of people are really took some of those big things and they think we're going to use them. Hopefully, they, they have a huge family yeah. or, or a community. Or you think, well, yeah. and, and that you lasts. You have a way to repackage them. Yeah. 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 So many of that stuff, you know, once you open them, it's still repackaged and then yeah. you use them. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and we always encourage people to do that. You know, when we were doing curbside deliveries, you know, when we were prepacking all the boxes. I, I told people every time, I said, you're going to get a box of food. If you can't use everything in it, share with your neighbor. Yeah. Really? I said, yes. Or bring, it bring it back, or bring it back here. If it's yeah. something you don't like, or you can't use, or, yeah. or give it to your kid. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Use, use it. Because when you pack those boxes, we tried to give them a variety. You don't know. But you don't know where they're going. Like well, and you don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, some people are very fussy. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and other people are like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so whatever you got, I'm good. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, but I know that a lot of people, it, it was freeing for them to, I can share, yes. Please share with me, mm -hmm. especially if you know they don't have much. Yeah. Share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have. The, you share. Yeah. Yes. We're sharing We're with you. You, you keep, keep sharing. Keep, keep passing, passing it on. on. Passing it on. <laughs> so, okay. okay. So let's see. We're up to Leviticus. All right. Let's see. Leviticus nineteen nine and ten. Matthew twelve. One two. Leviticus. Yeah. There's a lot of rules in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Exodus. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field to its very border, neither shall you gather the gleanings after you harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. At that oh, time, yes. Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck ears of grain and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Okay. In my elementary school years, every fall, our congregation would go out to farms after the farmers had done their harvesting. We'd systematically pick whatever produce was left behind, anything edible and good. This ancient practice called gleaning, common in many parts of the world, limits food waste and feeds hungry people. We see it in Leviticus where, as the people settle into the promised land, God reminds the community not to pick the land bare when they are harvesting. Instead, they are to leave some for the poor, the needy, the stranger, the orphan, and the widow. Wealthy farmers and even the subsistence ones would leave some of the harvest behind for people who didn't have the land or means by which to grow their own food. Jesus' disciples do their own gleaning in the Gospel of Matthew and are condemned for picking and eating grain from a field on the Sabbath. For contemporary readers, it might seem strange that religious leaders are more concerned about the day of the week than the fact that neither the land nor the grain belongs to them. But in Jesus' day, the community allowed travelers, all of whom would be vulnerable and food insecure, to glean from the fields. These ancient laws ensured that those with an abundance shared with those who had little. Today it is devastating when so much perfectly good food is tossed aside, not only because people are hungry, but because land, fossil fuels, and actual creatures are wasted. Food rescue work is gleaning with a modern twist. Many organizations, for example, save day-old bread and leftover buffet meals that can't be sold. The groups then share this bounty with people who really need it. So have you ever gleaned? Yes. Yes? But not to give to people to eat. Our band, we would go out and glean the cornfields after the corn was picked and throw all the unpicked ears into wagons and they sold it and the band got the money. So with the fundraiser. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That's a lot of work. So in what ways do you, do you limit waste or share from your abundance? We don't throw away any food at our house. Trying to eat it. Sure. Yes. You know, right. stuff. Like Scraps. I mean, you've got yeah. carrots in at the top, but yeah. You know, I'm sure to me, this is No, anything else. Compost. Compost. Yeah. Compost. One of those things I just stick to the edge and throw out like the papers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Try not to waste. After having worked at the food pantry, it's fun. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I just, I'm almost sick to my stomach when I throw stuff in my mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, mm -hmm. like, I almost get mad at myself. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you eat it sooner? Why did you fix it this way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I should have should, I done this. Like, but really, I was gone all week and I left milk in the fridge where Kim does it. He puts it in his coffee. That's funny. I ended up feeling that bad at 30 pounds because it's just, it wasn't good. And I was like, but I got thinking, oh, you know, I should have just curled it if I used it for mm -hmm. or, or use it for something. Maybe. And I thought, oh, why didn't I think about that? Or you could freeze it. <laughs> freeze it? Freeze it, yeah. You can you freeze, freeze milk. milk. I don't need to know. I, I've been thinking, I would I thought for sure he would have, I mean, there wasn't that much in there. <laughs> I should have known better. It's my own you fault. should have drank more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you get more milk. It was my own fault. <laughs> of course, the rest of us never make a mistake. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you buy that, I have some. Yeah. Property, like, I'd like something to like that. that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> something like that. Okay, let's see. Isaiah 50, 5. Is that where we are? Yeah. Okay. Isaiah 50, 5. Isaiah 50, 5. 
Okay, that's that. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor is on, on what is not satisfied? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affair. It was a short one. I remember spending my own money on chips and soft serve ice cream for middle school lunch every day. It wasn't exactly a nutritious or satisfying meal. Why did I buy that which didn't nourish me? Taste was more fun at that age. In con contemporary Western culture, we often spend a lot of the spot. We often spend a lot on things which are not food. Just read the list of unpronounceable ingredients in many snacks. This food is not good for our bodies or for our planet. So why are you spending money on that? Which is not food. For many, it is the only thing they can afford. For others, it's familiar or easy. It's also formulated to make us crave it. Isaiah is likely speaking in metaphors here, naming the good that God promises to bring to God's people. Still, those words can be an invitation to think about eating real food, that is, items with a recognizable ingredient list without chemicals or processing that can be grown, raised, or prepared. This food is good for our bodies and our planet. As we savor the real food in front of us, we remember the, we remember the one who gives us good food, the food that satisfies. God wants us to fill us God wants to fill us with things that will satisfy. When Jesus taught about prayer, he asked, Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish, would give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give food, to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to you, excuse me, to those who ask him? Many of us fill our emptiness with scrolling minus TV, alcohol, shopping, and food that is the good for us. To what do you turn to fill those empty places in yourself? And what things or practices might actually satisfy you instead? Mm -hmm. Reading. Well, I like to so, help people. I like to work at the sharing shop. I like to work at the food pantry. Walk. Walk. Walking is good. Biking. Sitting outside. Gardening. All of those things. Okay. Anything else you can think of? You guys thinking while we were talking, we were talking about you know, trying to make healthier choices, right? But... I know one thing we see with our families that come to the pantry, many of them would love to make healthier choices. The problem is it's so much more expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, fresh fruit. Yeah. 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 It's, you, know, you can buy a can of vegetables for well, a dollar and a half, but to buy it off the shelf fresh, and then of course it doesn't keep, Mm -hmm. You have to use it for a certain amount of time. So that's the other thing. Yeah. You know. I was going to say mm -hmm. storage. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, and then the same thing like pop. You know, a lot of them buy pop and soda instead of buying milk because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can get a you can get a six pack of pop for I don't know three three dollars, and it costs how much to get a gallon of milk? Well over four. Oh, pop has gotten up. It has, but it's still it's still cheaper. It's still cheaper than milk. Yeah. It's still way cheaper than milk. Way cheaper than milk. I don't know. Oh, it's two something. Two sixty. Yeah. That's cheaper than a twelve pack of pop. Yeah. Mm. But it just, I don't know, it just, our... It doesn't spoil. Our, yeah, yeah. You have to. Exactly. Our, our, it's just upside down. You know what I mean? It's just, mm -hmm. like, all the things that are not good for you. Are cheaper than the things that... Yeah. The meat, the fresh veggies, the milk. Yeah. 
Ooh. Is it getting better? Oh, no, it's better. Chips are expensive. Oh, yeah. Oh, they've been yeah. terrible. Potatoes. Yeah. Potatoes. <laughs> That's actually been a good thing because yeah. I've stopped, I stopped. I only buy just like a little bit and you know, yeah. make it last for a long time. See, <laughs> potatoes, potatoes are, not, are cheap compared to chips. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. It does, <laughs> make, yeah. it does make you crave it more. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's sweet it's or by design. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. It does make you crave it. It's terrible. <laughs> they aren't, didn't make them that way. Yeah. All right, so we're at Romans 14, so um, let's see, 1 through 8, and then 15 through 23, so through kind eight. of a variety of verses here. Yes. Yes. Welcome the person who is weak in faith, but do not argue with him about his personal opinions. <laughs> One person's faith allows him to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. The person who will eat anything is not to despise the one who doesn't. Well, the one who eats only vegetables is not to pass judgment on the one who will eat anything. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of someone else? It is own master who will decide whether he succeeds or fails. And he will succeed because the Lord is able to make him succeed. One person thinks that a certain day is more important than other days, while someone else thinks that all days are the same. Each one should firmly make his own, up his own mind. Whoever thinks highly of a certain day does so in honor of the Lord. Whoever will leave anything does so in honor of the Lord, because he gives thanks to God for the food. Whoever refuses to eat certain things does so in honor of the Lord, and he gives thanks to God. None of us lives for himself only. None of us dies for himself only. If we live, it is for the Lord that we live. And if we die, it is for the Lord that we die. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. 15 through 23. 15? Yeah. Through 23. If you hurt your brother because of something you eat, then you are no longer acting from love. Do not let the food that you eat ruin the person for whom Christ has Christ died. Do not let what you regard as good get a bad name. For God's kingdom is not a matter of eating and drinking, but the righteousness, peace, and joy which the Holy Spirit gives. And when someone serves Christ in this way, he pleases God and is approved by the others. So then we must always aim at, at uh, these, those things that bring peace and that help strengthen one another. Do not, because of food, destroy what God has done. All foods may be eaten, but it is wrong to eat anything that will cause someone else to fall into sin. Is that 20? 23. 23. The right thing to do is to keep from eating meat, drinking wine, or doing anything else that will make your brother fall. Keep what you believe about this matter, then, between you, yourself, and God. Happy is the person who does not feel guilty when he does something he judges is right. But if he has doubts about what he eats, God condemns him when he eats it, because his action is not based on faith, and anything that is not based on faith is sin. Interesting. Yeah, Carly, you want to read this next part? Bottom of, yeah, bottom of 36. Yeah. Are we yeah. answering oh, no, questions? Oh, no, I missed the question. That's, That's like a big question. Oh, mark. Sorry, I'm this so I'm tired. Okay, what this sort of behaviors reason. around food does Paul call out as harmful? What sort would build up? Judging others. Thanking mm -hmm. God. Well, you understand, he wrote this. Do you guys know the background of why he wrote this? So apparently the Romans were, you know, there was still the Jewish tradition of you only eat this kind of food and you only prepare it this certain way and, and it has to be kosher and, you know, all of this stuff. And, and he was saying, you know, you should be able to eat whatever you want to eat. However, if what you're doing causes your neighbor or your brother to sin, then that's not right. So that's kind of where this all, the background of where this comes from. So if you have a company and you know, well, it'd be like if you have and you know a diabetic, that sure. if you have yeah. a diabetic, yes, and, and you're one, serving a, an entire charcuterie of chocolate, and, and <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> and and that would be bad. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 
like when we do the pie sale, a lot of the things that I prepare, like I don't, and maybe I should label them more that way, but I do like sugar-free puddings and, and all those kinds of things because I know it's it's healthier for people not to eat all that sugar. None of us should eat all that sugar. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, any anytime you do something that you know could be harmful for someone you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, sometimes we do and we don't know. Yeah. You know, like there's a lot of people that I didn't realize they were diabetic until when it's like too late. It's like, oh, I mean, this I mean, pasta. Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, realize, yeah. Yeah, you know, it would have been nice if I knew. Yeah. Yeah. So you just try not to do things that. I think if you don't do it intentionally. I mean, if you, you don't yeah. know, it, it's not yeah. sin because you, you can't even no. know. No. Mm -hmm. If you know, then find out. Then the next time you do it better, you don't do it. So I guess the next question is, how did that work with Eve and Adam and the apple? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't go there, did she? No. No. She didn't go there. <laughs> she she didn't go there, did she? <laughs> okay, Carla, now I think we're ready to go on. Okay. Here we go. Paul writes to a community of early Christian believers who are divided by what foods to eat and whether some days should be celebrated. The food debate here does seem to be a split between the Jewish and non-Jewish parts of the community because faithful Jews would not be required to be vegetarian. So it seems the issue is less about piety and more about preference. Paul seems less concerned with what people eat and more about how they eat. So how do we eat? According to Paul, with gratitude. In the message paraphrase of the Bible, Eugene Peter Peterson translates verse 6 to say, If you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God and thank God for prime rib. If you're a vegetarian, eat vegetables to the glory of God and thank God for broccoli. This gratitude to God is echoed throughout scripture. Deuteronomy 8.10 reads, You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. We are reminded again that God is generous with Jesus' feeding, feeding of the 5,000 men, plus women and children. Gratitude ought to be our first response. Our food didn't just show up on our plate. A.J. Jacobs writes in A Thousand Thanks about praying his thanks for the food on his plate and all the people who made it possible. His son asked why he thanked God, but not the actual people. So Jacobs tried to do just that. He started by saying thank you to everyone who made his cup of coffee happen. It started with the barista and went on to the truck driver and the person who paved the road on which the truck drives and so on. As people of faith, we are grateful first to God and then to all the ones, human and non-human, who help bring food to our tables. She says, think about what you have for breakfast. Who can you thank for that? How long of a list do you want? Oh, start to start naming for the cereal with strawberries on it. The farmer who grew the grain and the fruit, the elevator where it was taken by the trucker who took it there, and the processor, and the packager, and the one who made the boxes and bags, and the truck that delivered it to the grocer, and the shelf stalker, and the checkout person. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I missed a few in there, but that's pretty good. <coughs> yeah, I got mine from Paula. <laughs> we know what you got. <laughs> yeah, I know what I had. Okay, so moving on here. All right, Marlene, you ready? Limiting the injury of others. In Romans 14, Paul doesn't weigh in on what kind of food is better to eat than another. Though it does feel like a bit of a slight to call vegetarians weak. Mm -hmm. Paul does call a community out for setting themselves above others and looking down on each other. Their judgments are destructive to their community and involve a kind of condescending superiority. We often judge each other for how we eat. Maybe it's about meat, like in the Roman church, or maybe it's because of prejudices about others' appearance or economic status. I've even heard comments about people who use SNAP benefits or food stamps in ways the observer doesn't approve of. 
Later, Paul writes, if your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. In a community which ate meals together regularly, some were asked to abstain from meat eating or shift other eating habits for the sake of the greater good and the growing faith of others to pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Paul's words moved me to think about the people I was just praying for. Folks stocking shelves late at night, farmers who spent long hours working and worrying, immigrant children working in unsafe conditions at meat processing plants. Does their eating injure other people, creatures, and the creation we are called to steward and protect? If this is the case, how can we change the way we eat so that we are walking in love? So who might be injured by what you eat? And what small or big shifts can you make to walk more faithfully in love? Well, the meat processing plants some, sometimes working in unsafe mm -hmm. conditions. Unsafe conditions. Mm -hmm. so let's improve that. Yes. Yeah. Child labor, I, I suppose, in some fields and some places. Some yeah. coffees. Mm -hmm. yeah. How much of that? That's pretty regulated here. How much of it actually? I suppose if people lie about their age or whatever, you don't have control of that. But yeah. Yeah. Other places I know about like coffee fields in mm -hmm. South America and Africa and places where they're not regulated like we are. Mm -hmm. Well, many of them are family farms too. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, how many family farms mm -hmm. here do you have kids working? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the kids are working and they're all working. I mean, they're not driving trucks and they have for generations. And they have yeah. for generations. But under the mindful supervision of the parents yes. as well, the grandparents, mm -hmm. probably, which I think that makes a difference, you know, when you're working towards the greater good of your family as opposed to. Yeah, no. going to a factory or a yeah. processing plant, or some abusing, abusing the child yes. laborers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or even if they're related, if they're not yeah. mindful of their abilities. And I think it's always important to just keep them mindful. Yeah. Uh, right? yeah. Okay, there's one biblical meal I saved for last. It was Jesus' last one, too, the institution of the Lord's Supper. Holy Communion is the means of grace, the place Jesus promises to show up in love for us. Everything we need to know about faithful eating can be learned from the Lord's Supper, where there is a place for everyone and enough for everyone. Nothing is wasted. The meal is just bread and wine, nothing fancy, expensive, or harmful, just simple celebratory and accessible. Each week, we say thank you and acknowledge that all creation sings praise alongside us. Each week, we learn to take, bless, break, share, and receive, becoming what we eat, Christ's body sent to feed the hungry world. Cool. Mm -hmm. I like that one. Yeah, I think it's chic. Ordered that very well. Mm -hmm. So, any thoughts about the other things we should be thankful for? Do we check them all? Sure, we do. There's a lot in the news tonight about the people that saw the eclipse, you know, and how. Oh, we're just, you know, you know, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, how it just, people were crying, and, you yeah. know, it's just really amazing. It would be something to see. You know. I just thought it was really cool to hear that the clouds actually yeah, parted. Yeah, so I did see it. It was like, this is awesome. <laughs> I kept watching each <laughs> little, I know, I just put time to get into the night. Like, like, yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> The doctor was like, oh, we're not going to see it at all. So I know, I didn't, wow. so, and, and as I was coming so home, I was actually here, and I was coming home, and I could see it. there was a little bit of blue sky, I thought, no. <laughs> a little bit more, and then I could see the sunshine, and I yeah. thought, oh, this is cool, we're going to actually get to see it. <laughs> I have never, ever remembered them saying, and I don't know, I wasn't listening to this too much, 
about the diamond effect of the total eclipse. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Because we never we have have seen, rarely, yeah. I've never seen a total no. eclipse. No. Oh, I know. The, I've seen like this. Yeah. It's almost mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, that, when they showed a picture oh, of that yeah. diamond, the, yeah. at the bottom, how it just burst into a. Yeah. Something. Neil Bell and Science Guy said he saw something that he'd never he seen before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he'd seen yeah. more than one eclipse. Mm -hmm. He'd seen a number of them. Well, that, again, that goes to show exactly. you know, how, you, how you see, you don't see things sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. See it, but you aren't paying enough attention. Yeah. You're, or you catch one eye, eye aspect of it and not another. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. To recognize that that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. See, the, <laughs> see the forest for the trees. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. ladies, we'll see ya. Bye. Good evening. Have a wonderful day. Cool.